Welcome, everyone. Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, Disney beats their expectations across the board with U.S. parks returning to profit. I think even more important than this, Disney continues to gain subscribers like crazy for Disney+. Plus. This is what a lot of investors said, hey, they're not going to be able to gain subscribers during the opening of the economy. They're not going to gain subscribers when it's the middle of summer. This has to taper off. Disney Plus has saturated its growth in the U.S., and it's really not gaining any more subscribers. Not exactly the case here. They went from 103.6 million subscribers in Q2 to Q3 having 116 million. So Disney Plus gained 12 million subscribers in a three-month period during the middle of summer, during the opening of the economy. Now, we also have the big news of the week. The big short investor himself, Michael Burry, is shorting ARK Innovation ETF. He's shorting Kathy Wood, and he's doubling down on his short position of Tesla. Now, how could Michael Burry be dumb enough to short innovation? He's basically shorting the future, technology, innovation, research, development, all these innovative, fast-growing companies, and he's betting against them. What a dummy, right? Now, of course, there's more to the story than that, and we're going to be discussing what Michael Burry is actually shorting. He is shorting something, but it's not innovation, and it's not Kathy Wood. We also have another subject that I think is important to talk about, and that is the subject of a couple companies consolidating entire industries, natural monopolies, and how these continue to go on bigger and bigger and bigger. We can take, for instance, big tech. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, and Facebook. These five companies, way back in 2011, only made up for around 7% of the S&P 500. Just 7%. And then as time went on, from 2011 to 12 to 15 to 2020, now in 2021, they make up 23% of the S&P 500. So not only are these companies growing, but they're taking up a bigger and bigger portion of the entire stock market. In fact, the S&P 500 as a whole right now is valued just above $30 trillion. That's the entire value of every company in the S&P 500. But just big tech alone, just these five companies make up over $9 trillion of that. And what they're doing is literally eating up the market, consolidating industry after industry. And one of the industries that they're clearly consolidating is media. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, the Hollywood actor, says, quote, Silicon Valley now owns Hollywood. Joseph Gordon-Levitt did a new movie on Apple TV, and he shares his thoughts on not only working with Apple, but the whole transition of Hollywood being now owned by Apple and Amazon. So we're going to be going over this as well. The consolidation of industries and specifically companies like Apple and Amazon now owning Hollywood. So we have a lot to get to. If you like this type of content, be sure to hit the thumbs up button, share it with friends. Also, there is a Patreon for this channel. If you want to help support the channel, you can join the Patreon. You get access to a lot of exclusive content to a very active Discord community and a lot of other fun benefits. And just another side note, a lot of people ask me on different episodes where I get these graphs. Where do I get this visual of Disney Plus subscribers growing that you can kind of cross out and look at ESPN subscribers or Hulu? I also use it for things like Apple's revenue growth. I can see the revenue growth of their iPhones or their iPads or just their services. I can look at that as well. So this website's called Hypercharts. There's a link in the description if you want to get a discount signing up for the premium version of it. This is one of the few websites that I do have the premium membership. I use it all the time. If you're interested in using this website, you can save some money by using the link in the description below. All right, now let's go ahead and jump right in. This is the passive income portfolio. It's my dividend portfolio. I do something a little bit different than most investment channels that I see on YouTube. At least I don't see many doing this. I show week by week my performance. I show week by week what this portfolio is doing, if it's gaining money, losing money, everything in between. There's some channels that give updates once in a while. They may give their input on different stocks or input on different companies and analysis, but I see very few that give a completely transparent look at every single investment week by week and the performance of it. So that's part of what this channel is about, is giving a transparent look at my investing process. Now, if we go through my portfolio, let's go and take a look at some of the holdings that have had recent news. One of them, of course, is Disney. I currently have 134 shares of Disney. It's around $23,300 of value. I'm in the green just by $3,100. So this is a position that I recently added to. I built it up to a bigger position because I think this company has the combination that I like. The combination that I like in any type of holding is a long duration. I think the company has a very long life ahead of it. It has very little downside and very high upside. That's the simple breakdown of it. I like long duration. 
I like ample upside, and I like very minimal downside. And I think that Disney possesses all three of those traits. This company has staying power. It has intellectual property and rights to things that make it so it's going to be relevant for a very long time. So the life cycle of Disney is very long. The company has opportunity. It has a growing streaming service in the age of digital entertainment. And I think the company has very minimal downside. It already survived 2020. It survived having its parks shut down for an entire year. The company is still profitable right now, even despite going through that. So I look at Disney as that perfect combination of an investment. It has good upside. There's lots of room for growth. It has long duration. It'll be around for a very long time, and it has very minimal downside, in my opinion. Now, Disney just recently had their earnings report, and they beat their expectations across the board. Their parks are now profitable again. But I think even more important than the parks is this line right here. The company top subscriber estimates for Disney Plus coming in at 116 million. The analysts were expecting 114 million. Disney Plus alone went from having 103.6 million subscribers to 116 million, meaning that Disney Plus gained 12 million subscribers in a three month period in the middle of summer during the reopening of the economy. A lot of people were expecting and saying that as soon as the economy opens back up, Disney Plus is done. It's going to taper out. It's going to gain like one or two million subscribers. You know, it's really not going to grow once people are free and they're not in lockdown mode. Well, that's clearly not the case. Netflix, for instance, has their growth slowing down a little bit. Their last quarter in Q2 was not great for Netflix. They only gained a couple million subscribers. And as of right now, as of their last quarter, they have 209.18 million subscribers, meaning that Disney Plus has passed the halfway mark of catching up to Netflix. Now to give this another view and more context of how rapidly Disney Plus is growing, we can look at a trend line from 2012 to 2021 of both Netflix's subscriber growth and Disney Plus. You can see that over this nine year period, Netflix has gained subscribers after subscribers, and then it got to 2020, and Disney Plus is just like a rocket, literally racing up towards Netflix. This is the new form of digital entertainment, and Disney's positioned very well right now taking advantage of this. Now, in terms of the stock price and the valuation of Disney, you can see the multiples that Disney's trading at compared to Netflix. Right now, Disney trades at a 3.9 times next 12 months price to sales, which means based off the revenue that they're earning, they're trading at 3.9 times that next 12 months revenue. Well, Netflix is trading at 7.6 times their next 12 months revenue. So Netflix is an almost double as expensive company, right? It's, it's trading at a much higher price to sales. And I think that this will converge over time. Netflix is trading at a higher premium because they have more subscribers at a higher ARPU and they are a 100% subscription business. But as Disney merges more into that subscription business, I believe that the price to sales multiple of Disney will move closer and closer to Netflix over time. So even though the stock this year has not performed that well, it's down 2%, it's just kind of hanging around the same price in the 170s, I'm not concerned at all about this company or the valuation of it. I think it's of good value and I think it's a fantastic company with a very bright future. We can also look quickly at a couple different companies. In tech and cloud computing, I only have two companies and that is Apple and Microsoft. Both of these companies have performed incredibly well. Year to date, Apple's only up around 14%, which doesn't seem that impressive, but the times that I bought into this company was at $90 a share is when I made my first video of why I'm buying Apple. I bought in pretty big at $90 a share. I sold like $20,000 worth of bonds and put that into Apple. And then I bought in again a second time with another $10,000 purchase at 125. So that is my two buy-in points for Apple. Now, if I'm making predictions on Apple's future, I think the multiple will continue to expand. And I think the price will go up somewhere around the 200s by the end of this year or into next year. My other big tech holding is, of course, Microsoft. This company is on fire this year. It's up 40% year to date. In fact, just today, Microsoft is up 2.42% on news that they're raising prices for Microsoft 365. I think that this is so dumb of investors that Microsoft announces they're raising prices for Microsoft Office and Microsoft 365 and investors say, hey, that's exciting. Microsoft can raise prices. So we're gonna buy more of the stock. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me because if you know Microsoft and the pricing power they have, you should know that they can raise prices anytime they want. That shouldn't be news. Microsoft has pricing power. This should not be news that makes it so investors want to buy in more of the company. So that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I think that Microsoft could raise prices three more times this year 
And not many companies would bail on its products because they are integrated into everything that a lot of Fortune 500 companies do. They simply cannot move away from Microsoft. Now, I also wanna give an update on one more of my holdings, which is in the real estate category, which is Vici, the real estate owner of the MGM properties, the Venetian, Caesars. They're a big real estate owner on the Vegas Strip. I bought into this company pretty heavily, and I'm currently in the red by $1,500. So I'm losing money on this company right now, right? Not really. I'm not selling any of my shares. They still pay their same dividend. The company's in good standing right now. It's doing fine. I think the acquisition will be good for this company. But I do believe that Vici is going to be under a lot of pressure in terms of the stock price as long as Delta variant is in the news. As long as the coronavirus continues to dominate the news cycle and we have different strands of the coronavirus going through, I think that that will put downward pressure on Vici because a lot of their business is conventions. And if people can't gather together, if people can't feel safe going to conventions, then Vici has to worry about that because their tenants aren't gonna be as profitable. So my prediction is, is that as long as the Delta variant is in the news and as long as it's spreading around and causing problems, making it so that people can't gather together, Vici properties won't trade at the same premium that it did. If the news becomes optimistic, if it looks like the Delta variant is behind us and the coronavirus altogether is mostly behind us, I think this stock will go up. Now, if you wanna see every holding in this portfolio, I have an updated link in the description. Now, moving on, I wanna jump into the big news of the week, which is that Michael Burry, the big short investor, is shorting Kathy Wood's major holdings like Tesla, and now he's directly shorting Kathy Wood's ARK Innovation ETF. He has a short position on it. It's not a huge position in Burry's portfolio, but he is short the ARK Innovation ETF. And a lot of people have criticized Michael Burry as being lucky one time in 2009 and that he, he doesn't really know what he's doing. He just shorts different things. But I think that this actually fits in well with his overall view of the world and his investment thesis. The first thing that you have to understand about Michael Burry is that he believes that there is more inflation than being reported. And he believes that inflation is going to continue to go up not taper down, and he strongly believes that the only way the Fed will be able to fight inflation is by raising interest rates. He thinks that's what they're going to have to do. And if the Fed does that, which Burry thinks they will, these type of companies, the ARK Innovation companies that have long durations on their earnings will be more negatively affected than other companies in the stock market. So that's his overall investment thesis. That's how he's viewing this. He's making a bet on interest rates going up and these type of unprofitable companies being further discounted. Now, Kathy Wood went on CNBC to address Burry's short position and to give her response. Well, you know what, when uh, I see such negative sentiment out there, especially when it uh, comes to valuation and longer uh, time horizons, investment time horizons, uh, I actually feel a, a, a little more comfortable. I like bad news and maybe uh, news that's uh, uh, not new, the discounting is is worse now than the news actually will be. I actually feel better in that kind of environment for, for our strategies. Uh, I don't think we're in a bubble, which is what I think many bears think we are um, a, in a bubble. And I remember the late 90s. Uh, you know, our strategy would have been cheered on, rah, 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 go, go get them, <laughs> right? You know, and you remember the leapfrogging of analysts uh, making estimates one higher than the other, price targets one higher than the other. We have nothing like that right now. In fact, you see a lot of uh, IPOs or SPACs coming out and falling to earth. We couldn't be further away from a bubble. And the reason for that is the innovation around which we have centered our research Search. Uh, the the these five platforms: DNA sequencing, robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, and blockchain technology are barely off the ground. The seeds for all of these platforms were planted in the twenty years that ended in the tech and telecom bust. So that's Kathy Wood's response. She says that we're not in a bubble. These companies are innovative. She talks about the eight pillars that they're working off of, how they're just getting started off the ground. And she also mentions a comparison to 1999, right before the 2000.com bubble, about how it's totally different now with her fund than back then. Because back then, there was analysts cheering on different funds like Kathy Wood's and ever-increasing price targets. But I don't think that's exactly accurate. There's actually a good portion of people in 1999 and banks and analysts that were warning about the ever-increasing valuations of different companies. They said it's not sustainable. 
So there was some conflict in 1999. Not everybody was in agreement. Not everybody thought the stock market would continue to go up. There was a good portion of people and analysts that thought that valuations were way too high. Now let's go ahead and examine that claim from Kathy Wood that her ARK Innovation ETF is not in a bubble. In fact, she says it's not even resembling a bubble. It doesn't even look like one. This is completely different than the 2000.com bubble, right? Here's the top 10 holdings in the ARK Innovation ETF. Just these top 10 holdings make up roughly 50% of the entire fund. At the very top, we have Tesla. And what I'll do is I'll attach PE ratio of each of these companies. With Tesla, the PE ratio is 655. With Roku, it's 596. With Teladoc, well, it doesn't really make sense to attach a negative PE ratio. That doesn't mean anything because there's no earnings. So Teladoc, I'll just put a loss. There's no multiple we can put there. With Square, it's 677. With Zoom, it's 125. With Shopify, it's 426. With Spotify, that company operates at a loss. So I'll just put a loss there. There's no PE ratio. Twilio, likewise, operates at a loss. Coinbase is 158 and Unity Software, operates at a loss. Now looking at these top 10 holdings of the ARK Innovation ETF with the multiples next to them, or whether they're money-making companies at all, does this look a little bit bubbly? What do you think? Do you think Kathy Wood is right that this doesn't resemble a bubble? It doesn't resemble the 2000.com bubble? Or does it look a little bit enthusiastic to you? When I look at this, I think that even good companies, even great companies like Microsoft, can make bad investments. In the 2000.com bubble, Microsoft sold off over 50% and took over 10 years to recover to its original price. That's a great company at a very bad valuation. So a lot of these companies, even though they might be great companies, you have to be very careful when investing in them. The price that you're paying matters. And if you're investing in companies like this, you have to be confident that they will grow into massive companies and surpass their high expectations. We can look at even more data for the ARK Innovation ETF. This is something that Kathy Wood doesn't really share on her fact sheet or anything on her website. But if you actually calculate the earnings yield overall of the ARK Innovation ETF, it is a money losing fund. It has a negative 1.2% earnings yield. So in aggregate, with every company, according to their allocation in that fund, it loses money. Overall, it's a money losing fund. Compare that to the S&P 500. The S&P 500 has an earnings yield of 3.5%. So ARK Innovation is not just a fund of innovative, exciting companies, it's a fund of currently money losing companies. And remember, when you're buying a company, you're really buying the future cash flows of that company. That's what you're paying for, is its future profitability. If the fund is losing money right now, which it is, that means that these companies have to be extremely profitable down the road. So it makes total sense to me that someone like Michael Burry would be shorting the ARK Innovation ETF. He doesn't care that these companies are innovative. He doesn't care about the eight pillars of innovation or whatever Kathy Wood's talking about. He sees a fund of money losing companies with a very long duration, their earnings way out in the future and rising interest rates on their horizon. That's what Michael Burry sees. And he doesn't care at all about being popular or being criticized. When he was shorting the housing market, he received a lot of criticism. There was not many people that agreed with him on that short. Now, moving on, I wanna go into this subject of big tech's continued growth and their consolidation of different industries. Right now, big tech is consolidating the entertainment industry. They're buying Hollywood. And Joseph Gordon-Levitt has pointed this out, saying now Silicon Valley owns Hollywood. The difference, of course, is that now all the big buyers at Sundance are tech companies, and that changed very quickly. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I, um... I feel pretty fine about it in general, to be honest. So, like, I, I have concerns about some of the ways that uh, big tech is changing our world, but I also have a lot of concerns about the way old Hollywood was <laughs> impacting the world. And, you know, far be it for me to make some kind of absolute statement about the moral authority of Apple, but compared to other tech giants, I feel really good about working for Apple. He's not against it. In fact, he doesn't think it's such a problem that big tech owns Hollywood. He thinks that there were problems with Hollywood before, and it's not necessarily any worse now that companies like Apple and Amazon are running the show. In fact, Joseph Gordon-Levitt goes on in this podcast to explain the level of creativity that he could bring to the movie he wanted to create. 
that it's far more than what Hollywood would offer. Apple just says, hey, here's some money, go create a movie, and he's able to shape the movie exactly how he wants. Where in traditional Hollywood, they'd have much more strict guidelines of what they'd be able to create. So he thinks that the industry moving to Apple and Amazon will actually allow for better creativity than it did before. Out of all the big tech companies, I think Apple and Amazon have by far the best chance of consolidating this industry. Now raise your hand if you think you're a lucky person. Just Ramon. Okay, raise your hand if you think you're unlucky. Apple takes a completely different strategy than that of Netflix or Amazon or any other major studio in that they're creating only original content. So their library is starting off very small, but they are pouring a lot of money into what I consider to be very high production value, very high quality content. They have new shows like this, like Mr. Corman. These are more creative works by different actors like Joseph Gordon-Levitt, but they're also doing very high budget, epic projects. One of those, of course, is Foundation. When I was a child at the edge of the galaxy, I heard stories about a man who could forecast the future. But the story remained dark to me until many years later. Until it became my story. Until it became the only story. You're familiar with my work, psychohistory? Every mathematician has read your theory. It's not a theory. It's the future of mankind expressed in numbers. And the Empire won't like the future I predict. We should kill them. We can murder the men, but what about the movement, brother? Martyrs tend to have a long half-life. His math was right. The Empire is dying. Wars will be endless. <laughs> Thousand worlds reduced to cinders. Now I couldn't find what Apple's budget is for this series, but it just looks expensive. This is the type of stuff that's very difficult to compete with. Lots of people can create reality TV shows. Lots of people can create dating shows or cooking shows, but to create an epic like this requires a lot of money, and that is something that Apple has. So Apple's obviously taking the entertainment opportunity here very seriously. I don't think this is a little side thing for Apple, and it's definitely not for Amazon. Amazon has the other highly anticipated epic series, The Lord of the Rings. They have the rights to it, and they haven't released any type of teaser or trailer, but they did release just one still frame, one frame of it, and it looks pretty phenomenal. You know, this is just one image, but as far as I can tell, this looks pretty high quality as well. So I know a lot of people are looking forward to seeing this series as well. So the moral of the story is, is that Joseph Gordon-Levitt is correct. Silicon Valley now owns Hollywood, specifically Apple and Amazon. I think that these are the two big companies that will consolidate this industry. And this just goes along with the common theme. As long as Congress and as long as the SEC allows these companies to continue doing this, to continue buying up and consolidating industry after industry, you have to stay invested in them. They own the present and the future of media, entertainment, and communication. And as long as that goes on, you have to stay invested. So that's all for today. If you like this type of content, I'll have another exclusive released this weekend on the Patreon. So you can check that out if you're interested. It's risk-free. There's a free trial. There's a link in the description below. And if not, I'll see you next week.